It just shows you when the men turn up here, they do it double. So that was a very famous octet. And uh, man, thank you very much for that item. It's a beautiful item. Sandra, also, thank you for the children's story. Very rarely does the person who tells the children's story link it to the sermon. And Sandra did that beautifully. So it just shows you we've got uh, somebody leading us today. And I believe the Lord's been leading here this year. I don't know what you think about 2017, but 2017 seems to be a year that the church is really going to come alive. And uh, already there's indications of this. When uh, Georgia took our first sermon here and she talked about the, uh, that great parable of Jesus about the sower, you know, she talked about the four types of soil and we represent that soil. And what she challenged us is what sort of soil are we going to be? Are we going to be the receptive soil where the Spirit of the Lord is going to sow the seed and it will grow in us or are we going to be stony ground? So uh, that was a great sermon, Georgia, and it, it, it started off this year very well. And then Ben came along the next week, and he preached on the work of prayer in our lives, how we're not going to get anywhere unless we're praying. Now, it's not a coincidence that in February we've got the week of prayer here. And I just hope that... Uh, are we going all right with the sound system, by the way? Seems very echoey. Oh, you boys are happy down the back. Nothing can be better. A little screech there occasionally. Ben talked to about prayer and how we will not get anywhere in this life without prayer. And it's not just the prayer that we kind of think of God for a couple of minutes on the way to the train or the bus in the morning, but deep prayer where we spend time in our, on our knees where we pray perhaps all night. I don't know whether you've ever done that, but it's quite an experience. Well, I want to carry on this theme of uh, the Lord leading us. And um, my sermon today comes from the Old Testament. Many people say the Old Testament, that's old, old stuff. The Old Test Testament is full of the Gospel. The Gospel is nowhere better exemplified than in the Old Testament. And if you think of the children of Israel as they came out of bondage out of Egypt and how they, all the experiences they had and what lessons we can learn from that. They seemed to be doing all right for a while and then they went astray. And then the Lord through the leadership of Moses had to guide them and direct them. They should have gone almost straight to the promised land but they didn't because of their unfaithfulness. And so for 40 years... The Lord had them wandering in the desert. And I'm wondering if sometimes our wanderings in the desert are because we are not faithful to God. We come up with all our own fancy ideas. And the Lord doesn't guide us into the promised land. Moses himself never made it to the promised land and that was a great tragedy. One of the great tragedies of the Old Testament. But the Lord, of course, did not forget him. But today I want you us to think about when they actually got into the promised land. Forty years after they first of all should have gone there, they were once again on the shore of the River Jordan. But things were different. And they had to wait for the Lord to give them guidance. You see, this time, as they stood by the River Jordan, the river was in flood. And how were they going to get across into the promised land? How were they going to get to the city of Jericho, which was their first major obstacle? Well, the Lord had them do something different. And that's something that we need to be conscious of, that the Lord has many ways of working. He has many ways of working on our lives. And so as the children of Israel came there by the River Jordan, with Joshua now leading them, the instruction from the Lord was that instead of the priests carrying the ark in the middle of the congregation, protected by all the people, the priests were to go out in front, in fact almost a kilometre in front of the children as they were marching. 
as they came to the river. Now that's a long way in front, isn't it? Why were the priest and the ark out in front? Because the Lord wanted to show that he was leading by his spirit. And so the priest picked up the ark, the ones designated to do so, and marched to the river Jordan. What happened? Nothing. The river was in flood. The priest marched down into the water. What happened? Nothing. All they had was cold, freezing water around their ankles and around their knees. They must have been worried men. This is the first time that this had happened. But then the Lord acted because they'd been faithful to his instructions and the water stopped right there and it piled up and the water below raced on down towards the Dead Sea. And the priest walked out and stood on dry ground in the middle and then the children of Israel marched over. It must have taken them a fair time to do that, but all the time the priests were standing in the middle of the river, no water passed by them. And then when the priests came up out of the, out of the river, once the children of Israel had crossed, then the water started to flow again. What an incredible demonstration of the power of God, a repeat of what happened when the children of Israel came out from Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. Well then, of course, Israel had to begin its work of taking the land and the first big obstacle was Jericho and we know the story well of Jericho. How they followed the Lord's instructions and they marched around that city seven times blowing trumpets but the people making no sound. And then on the seventh day they marched seven times and on the signal they gave a shout and the trumpets blasted and the walls came down and Jericho was taken. Children of Israel were very happy about that because this was a great victory. And so the next obstacle that they faced was a little town called Ai, just a few kilometres away. And so the men came to Josh and said, look, uh, we've had a big day. Uh, we won't send all the boys out. This is just a little operation. So we'll go down there with a few thousand men and we'll take Ai. Now, nowhere did they pray. Nowhere did they ask the Lord's guidance. Nowhere did they ask if this is what the Lord wanted. They did before they went to Jericho. This is a big thing. We always pray before we do big things. But do we pray before we do little things? And they didn't. So off they went down to AI, saying, well, farewell, we'll be back for lunch. Make sure it's all ready for us. Well, they were back for lunch, all right, with their tail between their legs. They'd been hopelessly defeated. And they wondered why. It's because there'd been no prayer in their life. There'd been no planning. They had not asked for the Lord's leading. They had done their own thing. And if we're going to get to the promised land, folks, we've got to follow what the Lord wants us to do, not what we want to do. And so they had to learn that lesson. Well... The children of Israel were in the promised land. You know how long they were there before they actually took over the promised land? 300 years. That's a long time, folks, isn't it? We've been preaching the Lord's coming, the Lord's coming, the Lord's coming, and he hasn't come. Our Adventist church was set up in 1863 preaching the message of the Lord's coming and here we are in, 19, in 2017 and the Lord's still not here. Why is that? Why does the Lord delay his coming? Perhaps for the same reason that the children of Israel didn't take the promised land because they weren't faithful, they didn't get about the Lord's work the way he wanted them to and so there they were. In that time, particularly towards the end, they realised things weren't going well so they wanted a king and so they got Saul to be their first king. Now he's a good choice because he's a big man. He stood head and shoulders above anybody else. He was probably about a seven footer or something like that. He, he, was, he was a big lad. Would have made it into a basketball team probably. Might have even played Aussie rules if he had made a mistake. But uh, there he was, King Saul, the first king. And he did alright for a while, he and his son Jonathan, but then he fell away because his spirituality left him. 
and Saul ended up dying on the battlefield with his son being killed or killing himself or really so things were bad but God still had another plan we were talking in Sabbath school today what happens when God's plans go astray well God always has alternative plans they may not be for the best but God had another plan and this is where David comes in David of course had worked with Saul, fought for Saul, been with Saul, been chased by Saul. But now David went down to his own tribe down in the south of Israel, to Hebron, and there he ruled over his own tribe. And the children of Israel, now feeling that they needed a leader if they're going to get anywhere, came to David and they said, would you be our king? So David agreed to be their king. But he was wise enough not to want to stay in Hebron. He realized that he needed to get into a territory that didn't belong to any tribe. And strangely enough, there was a a city nearby by the name of Jebus. And this city had, naturally, the Jebusites in it. And the Jebusites were a pretty warlike people and nobody had been able to defeat them. In fact, they were so cocksure of their ability that they said, look, if, if we were blind and lame in here, we could still defeat you guys out there. So don't even think about coming up against us. But David got his people together and he said to them, now look, this city that seems to be so strong has a weakness. And that weakness is actually their strength. In those days one of the greatest things and it's still the biggest problem for an army today is the supply of water if you're ever going to go anywhere to fight water for the troops is the number one problem not ammunition, not guns, not bazookas not atomic bombs, it's water the number one problem for an army and the number one problem in Jebus was solved because just outside the city wall was a spring called Gihon and what had happened even before the Jebusites, is that a tunnel had been dug from this spring inside the city and a shaft sunk. So you've got a 60-foot tunnel and you've got a 40-foot shaft and then steps that led up inside the city. And it was possible for people to withstand the effects of an encircling army being besieged because they could get to water without going outside the city. Now this was a bit of a secret and nobody seemed to know this except David knew it. David had been cutting around that area for for quite a few years and he knew that what was the strength of Jebus was its weakness. Now I wonder if that's the same with us in many cases. Have we come to think that our strength, the thing we do best, is going to save us when in fact it may be the thing that's going to trap us because we become self-assured. So David got his men together and he said to them, look, whoever can get into that shaft and into the city, I'll make him captain of my army. Now, can you imagine that? Sliding along a 60-foot tunnel, dark and slippery, going up a 40-foot shaft. How would you go up a 40-foot shaft, Andrew? No light, no, nothing to hang on to. And then up inside the city just waiting for some lady to come along with a bucket to drop it on your head when you're going up the shaft. It's a bit of a frightening experience, isn't it? So when David asked, who will do it? Of course, nobody wanted to do it. No, that's not true. When David asked, he was nearly killed in the rush because David had about 800 mighty men around him and these men were incredible warriors. And the man who jumped forward first was his nephew, Joab. Joab said, I'll do the job, and he did, and he got inside into the shaft, up up the vertical shaft, into the city. They undid the gates of the city, and they took that city in just a very few minutes because their strength was their weakness. So David went into that city, he took it over, and he renamed it, and he named it Jerusalem. And that's how the Israelites came to be associated with Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And that became the holy city. 
Well, once they got into that city, of course, this wasn't the end of things. We find that uh, when they got in there, it says in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 11, Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, along with cedar logs and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a palace for David. And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. So David became famous, not just there, but famous throughout the land. And other people sent tribute to him because they knew that nobody had been able to beat the Jebusites up till that time. So David was settled in the city. You would think things would be right. It's a bit like us when we come to, to the Lord and we give our heart to the Lord. We have a week of prayer and everything seems to be wonderful. That's not the time to sit back because the devil, like a roaring lion, still wants to come to us. And if you've got your Bibles, I know we don't carry Bibles these days, got your iPad, got your iPhone, have you? You've got the lot. Good old Andrew. If you've got your Bibles, Second Samuel chapter 5. Verse 17. I just want to look briefly at a section here which to me is very helpful. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. David knew the Philistines well. He had lived with them. The Philistines were the mightiest force in Israel at that time. They had chariots and they had iron weapons. They had all sorts of things. When the Israelites wanted to get their farming implements sharpened, they had to go to the Philistines even. Because the Israelites didn't even have a blacksmith. So the Philistines were a major, major force. And so here David, as he was about to start ruling in Jerusalem, his first great challenge was the Philistines. So they came up. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up and attack the Philistines? Will you hand them to me? Now I guess it's not surprising, is it, that David prayed. But he didn't go rushing off and say, well, Look, we knocked off the Jebusites easy, so we'll, we'll do our best against the Philistines. David prayed and he asked for the Lord's guidance. Will I go up? Will I attack them? Do I do a frontal assault on them? And the Lord said, Go, for I will surely hand the Philistines to you. So David went to Baal Perizim, and there he defeated them. He said, As waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So that place was called Baal Perizim. The Philistines abandoned their idols there. And David and his men carried them off. The Philistines didn't think that David would come out because they were the bigger, stronger force. They were going to win the game without even really trying, they thought. And so they weren't prepared for David to attack them, but he took the initiative under the Lord's guidance and went out and attacked them and defeated them and sent them scurrying back home down to the coast and they were in such a hurry they left their idols there and David and his men carried them off. Well, that was a mighty victory, wasn't it? Here's their biggest enemy, the Philistines, defeated in the first battle. So you'd think you could sit back and take it easy like Jericho. But what happened? Verse 22. Once more the Philistines came up and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, can you imagine it? This mob, these Philistines, still a great force, right back in the same place. You'd think, I wish they'd forget it. But they didn't. They were right back in the same place. Now, what would David do if he'd been like them at Jericho? Because, look, we've beaten them once, we'll go out and we'll beat them again. But again, David said, Lord, what should I do? And the Lord said, But circle round behind them and attack them in front of the balsam trees. As soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, move quickly, 
because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. In the King James Version, has a quaint expression that says, when you hear the sound of a going. But in other words, the Lord says to, to David, I want you to go up, but I want you to wait for me. And don't do a frontal attack on them. Go behind them. Circle round about behind them. But don't do anything until I give you the signal. And when I give you the signal, then get up, because then you will know that the Lord has gone out before you and will give you victory. As soon as you hear the sound of marching feet in the tops of the balsam trees, move quickly, because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. So, so David did as the Lord commanded, and he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Giza. This was the last great conflict that, that Israel ever had with the Philistines. There were times when they skirmished with them, but this was the, a great defeat, and the Philistines were defeated. And why were they defeated? They were defeated because David and his men followed the Lord's instructions, and above all, they waited on him. They didn't rush ahead. And I think that we as a church this year, we're off to a start where we're saying we want to dedicate our lives to the Lord. We want to dedicate our ministries to the Lord. We want to dedicate our homes to the Lord. We've made a good start. But let's not rush ahead, coming up with all our plans. We sometimes keep churning out the same old thing, thinking it's going to be successful, and we wonder why it's not. I even think of the way we've done evangelism over the years. When I became an Adventist back in 1958, he couldn't get to the mission meetings. I remember Pastor Coulthard came to Auckland and he took over the Regent Theatre, one of the largest picture theatres in town, and the place was filled, so filled they'd have five sessions. Now that just wouldn't work today. That sort of approach doesn't work, but those days it did. We've got to be prepared to follow the Lord and his leading. Now, I don't know how the Lord's going to lead us here in this church this year and what's going to be the most successful way of reaching people, but I do know the place to start is with us. Getting the soil of our heart right, praying for the Lord's leadership, seeking his guidance. And we may be amazed at what he opens up for us, but if we wait for him, he will go before us. We've been talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in Sabbath school. The Holy Spirit will lead and guide us and above all, the Holy Spirit will empower us and fill our hearts. And unless we're led by the Holy Spirit, we will not be successful. So this year, folks, is going to be a tremendous year. I feel that. Some people know why I feel that. Because I'm getting older. And I've always said, and I mean this, the Lord is coming in my lifetime. I've told my mother that when I was eight years old and I'd never heard of the Adventist church or anything like that. I'd never heard a sermon on the second coming. I'd gone to church in the Presbyterian church, which was good. But I said to mum, I don't think I'm going to die. I think the Lord's going to come in my lifetime. Now, that was 72 years ago, folks. Just like the children of Israel creeping around trying to get to the promised land. They didn't get there because they weren't faithful. Now, folks, at almost 80 years of age, the Lord's got to hurry. <laughs> or else my prophecy is wrong. I don't think we're worrying about the prophecy. The wonderful thing is, if I died tonight, the Lord would be here in the morning, wouldn't he? Because the next thing I know, the Lord would be here. Provided what? I'm faithful and stay near to him. Lord, the Lord, folks, the Lord wants us to be faithful. He wants us to be patient. He wants us to wait upon him. But my sincere prayer is that here, this church may so show the love of Jesus. It's not the Adventist church that's going to save the world. It's not our doctrine. It's not anything like it. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who saves. And by his spirit, People will be one and they'll be touched. 
And uh, we've got incredible things happening in the world. We've got old brother Trump doing his stuff today. Unbelievable, really. Uh, the world's crazy. It is. In Europe, there's not a, a, a decent government in the whole of Europe. Africa, of course, has given up a long time ago. South America hasn't found out what government is yet. And uh, here in lovely old Australia, New South Wales, Premier just retires. God's own country, New Zealand. Prime Minister, after seven years, steps down. I mean, what's happening? The world is going crazy. There's no leadership, folks. But this is the time where we can be leaders because the Lord wants us to uplift Jesus and to preach his word. So when we say to the Lord, what shall we do? He will tell us, he will guide us, and we will be victorious. And that's my prayer.